Looking back into history, one thing we can know is that kings and queens or rulers or whatever just love to build some fucking huge thing. And why? Maybe they want to flex upon other nations, how rich and powerful their empire is. But whatever the cause is, some of these mega structures become an iconic landmark and the wonders of the world, but while some of them remain unfinished or never built. And this is exactly what happened to Hitler's failed plan for the Volkshalle and the Soviet Union's Palace of the Soviets. And today I would like to take you through five of such mega structures. So coming first in the list is the Volkshalle. During World War II, Hitler wanted to rebuild Berlin after their planned victory in the World War. He wanted Berlin to be remodeled and renamed into Germania and make it the cultural and architectural capital of the world. Volkshalle, which is the Great Hall or Hall of Glory, was a proposal for a monumental domed building, which would serve as the city center of the new Berlin or otherwise Germania. Conceived by Hitler, the Nazi dome building was designed by Albert Speer, Hitler's chief architect and a high official in the Nazi government. The primary intention of Hitler's palace, the gargantuan Volkshalle, was to be a demonstration of the prowess and prosperity of Nazi Germany. The Volkshalle was to serve as a colossal assembly hall for mass gatherings and ceremonies, symbolizing the power and unity of the Nazi regime. Speer's design itself was based upon Hitler's drawing, and the drawing was ultimately inspired by the Roman Pantheon, which Hitler visited in 1925. While in 1938, Hitler had made a point of visiting the Pantheon on an official trip to Rome. Now, the sheer scale of this project would blow your mind. It would be so huge that it would basically dwarf every other structure in Berlin. The structure would rise up to a 290 meters, which means it would be as tall as the Eiffel Tower. The oculus or roof light in the center of the dome would be 46 meters in diameter. It would be able to easily accommodate the dome of St. Peter's Basilica itself. The total height of the structure was approximately 290 meters. The dome of the Volkshalle was to rise from a massive granite podium square of 315 by 315 meters. The dome alone was two-thirds of the total height of the structure and 250 meters in diameter. The interior of the Volkshalle is still as similar to the Pantheon. At the north end, there would be a large niche of 50 by 28 meters, surfaced with gold mosaic and enclose an eagle 24 meters. From there, Hitler would address a massive audience seated in three concentric tiers of seats. The three concentric tiers of seats enclosing a circular arena, 140 meters, was based on the design of the Colosseum. The Volkshalle was estimated to have housed a capacity of over 180,000 people. When Speer talked to British and American architects, one of them told him that the breathing of a massive audience of 180,000 Nazis would form clouds under the dome. The dome would be creating weather of its own. On top of the dome's lantern was the German heraldic eagle, clutching the globe of the earth, which represented the dominance of the German Reich over the world. The temple-like nature of the domed building was noted by Speer, who surmised that the building was ultimately intended for public worship of Hitler, his successors, and the German Reich. However, the Pantheon had been created for an empire that survived four centuries. The Volkshalle was to symbolize an empire planned to endure a thousand years. But unfortunately, as we all know, the Third Reich missed its target by 998 years, and neither the Volkshalle nor Germania were built. Next in the list is the Palace of the Soviets. It was the day of the creation of the Soviet Union, the 30th of December, 1922. The same day Sergei Kirov proposed construction of a new national convention center. This, according to the official Soviet narrative, was the beginning of the story of the Palace of the Soviets. The real planning of the palace began in 1931. The purpose of the palace was to house sessions of the Supreme Soviet, which is the legislative body of the USSR, as well as offices for other government agencies, including various governmental institutions. The project was conceived as a grandiose symbol of Soviet power and ideology, intended to surpass the scale and magnificence of similar structures in the West, such as the U.S. Capitol in Washington, D.C. They also needed it for propaganda purposes. A design competition was held in 1931 to search for the design of the palace. Architects were invited to submit proposals for the grand structure. The winner announced in 1933 was a Russian architect, Boris Eofan. His design was modified in tandem with Vladimir Shchuko and Vladimir Gelfrake. 
The design was a neoclassical skyscraper resembling an enormous tiered wedding cake and features a colossal 80-meter-high statue of Lenin. The proposed site for the Palace of the Soviets was the location of the Cathedral of Christ the Savior in Moscow, which had been demolished by the Soviet government. Now, if the construction was ever finished, it would have been the tallest building in the world at that time, reaching the staggering height of approximately 415 meters, including the Lenin statue. The construction of the palace's foundation and substructure commenced in 1940. A massive concrete foundation was laid to support the planned superstructure of the palace. This foundation was designed to accommodate the immense weight of the proposed building, including the statue of Lenin on top. But at 1941, Hitler had launched an invasion on the Soviet Union. Many of the workers went to war. Factories and workshops were mobilized for the war effort. Resources were used for building defense and armaments. So the construction was halted. But when the World War came to an end, Stalin had already lost interest in the palace and construction never began again. In the 1950s, the massive concrete base was transformed into an outdoor swimming pool known as the Moskva Pool, which became a popular recreational facility in Moscow. The swimming pool operated for several decades until the 1990s when the decision was made to rebuild the Cathedral of Christ the Savior on the same location. And next is the cenotaph for Isaac Newton. Etienne Louis Boulet was an 18th century French architect whose ideas and designs were far ahead of his time. Yet his most compelling work was his design for the cenotaph for the great scientist Isaac Newton. It was 19 years after Newton published his groundbreaking discoveries in his book Principia. A French mathematician, Emily du Châtelet, would translate his works into her language. Her translation made his works more comprehensible, which would popularize him and his work in France. From then on, Newton would become one of the most renowned thinkers of the Enlightenment. And then, 78 years later, another Frenchman inspired by Newton's legacy would set out to design a grand cenotaph to honor him and his legacy. The cenotaph was designed as a gigantic sphere, measuring 150 meters in diameter. The structure was also encircled by hundreds of cypress trees, which also associates with the symbol of mourning in Greek and Roman traditions. The sphere is embedded within a three-tiered cylindrical base, intended to represent the universe as understood through Newtonian physics. Boulet's design centered around the symbolic representation of Newton's discoveries about gravity and the cosmos. The choice of the spherical structure is to symbolize the universe and reflecting Newton's work on gravity and celestial mechanics. The shape also represented perfection and completeness, ideal attributes to honor Newton's contributions to science. The interior of the cenotaph was to be a vast void with the tomb of Newton placed at the lower center point. As you can see it, the scale of the humans is so tiny as compared to the size of the sphere. The diameter of the sphere being 150 meters, it would have been larger in height and diameter than the Great Pyramid of Giza. There was to be a huge entrance leading into a long, dark tunnel of about 150 meters before finally getting to the tomb. During daytime, a beam of sunlight would come through the holes on the walls of the sphere, creating a star-like effect. The intention was to create a planetarium by simulating a night sky. At night, light radiates from a big luminaire suspended at the center point of the sphere, making the cenotaph a glowing sphere in the darkness, turning the entire structure into a grand celestial body. The exterior was to be clad with non-reflective black stone, enhancing the spherical form's visual impact against the sky and its surroundings. But yeah, of course, the structure would never be built because it was challenging for the engineering and construction technologies available in the 18th century, and as well as due to financial restraints but his vision went on to inspire generations of modern artists and architects with a new way of thinking about nature and human creativity. His ultimate satisfaction was not the execution of his designs, but the inexhaustible source of their inspiration. Now, let's talk about something higher, at least a mile high, like the Mile High Illinois. The Illinois, or the Mile High Illinois, is a concept proposal for a skyscraper that was to be over one mile high, obviously, and was conceived and described by American architect Frank Lloyd Wright, in the year 1957, the building was to be built in Chicago. It would be having 528 stories and having parking for 15,000 cars and 100 helicopters. If built, it would top the list of the tallest buildings in the world by far, being more than four times the height of the Empire State Building, almost twice as tall as the world's current tallest building, the Burj Khalifa. Wright believed that it would have been technically possible 
to construct such a building even at the time it was proposed. At the time, the tallest skyscraper in the world was New York's Empire State Building, which was only one-fourth of the total height of the Illinois. It probably would have been possible to erect a self-supporting steel structure of the required height, but there are a number of problems that occur when a building is that tall. Let me explain. The material used to build tall towers at that time is steel, which is quite flexible. So it is possible that winds would sway the tower, which would cause discomfort for occupants of higher floors. But Wright always knew about this. That is why a tripod design is given to the structure later on. This also could have been solved by placing a tuned mass damper somewhere within the tower, as was done in the Citigroup Center and Taipei 101. Although this design innovation was not well known until decades later, Wright explained that there would be 76 elevators. The 76 elevators would be divided into five banks or groups, with each elevator group serving a 100-floor segment of the building. The elevators were to be atomic-powered, capable of mile-per-minute speeds. Next in the list is the Exceed 4000. Now, the immense scale of this structure would blow your mind. This is a height comparison between Burj Khalifa and the Exceed 4000. As you can see, the Exceed 4000 completely dwarfed Burj Khalifa, which is currently the tallest building in the world. It is about five times taller than the Burj Khalifa. The Exceed 4000 is an ambitious architectural concept proposed by the Taisei Corporation in Japan, designed to be the tallest building in the world. This hypothetical megastructure would stand 4,000 meters tall surpassing even Mount Fuji by 224 meters. It was designed to serve as an architectural trend to sustain and accommodate drastically growing cities like Tokyo in the future. The megastructure was designed as a futuristic environment, combining ultra-modern and technological living with self-contained wildlife and nature with minimal impact on the surrounding environment. Basically, it would serve as a city containing shopping malls and markets inside the building itself so that the residents would not bother to come out. The structure would be able to accommodate about 500,000 to 1 million people. The structure would have a six kilometers wide base on the sea with 800 floor capacity. This structure would have been composed of over 3 million tons of steel. You can build the Eiffel Tower 300 times with that much steel. The structure looked like Mount Fuji because they took the inspiration from it. However, the Exceed 4000 was never meant to be built. The purpose was to earn some reputation for the Taisei Corporation. The cost of construction would be between $900 billion to $1.7 trillion. And if it were to be really built, it would face significant challenges. The Exceed 4000 would have been forced to actively protect its inhabitants from internal air pressure and external air pressure gradations and weather fluctuations that its massive elevation would cause. Moreover, the sea base of Exceed 4000 is located in the Pacific Ring of Fire, which is the most active volcano range in the world. The Exceed 4000 would have been in danger of earthquakes and tsunamis. 